Hi, Tom. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me onto the podcast. Thank you for taking the time to speak to us. First off, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. So my name is Tom Kittle. I'm director at Nile, which is the Norwich Institute for Language Education. We're a specialist teacher training, teach development, ELT institute in the east of England. And um, I guess I got into to, uh, English language teaching through uh, the CELTA and, and traveling and teaching and then um, did the DELTA and the Masters in Language Testing, which is uh, why I'm talking to you today about testing and assessment. Uh, at Nile, I run uh, our MA modules on testing and assessment and also our uh, module on language teaching methodology. On a personal side, I, I've got uh, two, two young kids who keep me very busy uh, outside of work and sometimes inside of work as well. <laughs> Brilliant. So, so testing and assessment is your uh, specialism, and a lot of ELT teachers are drawn to a particular specialism like teaching pronunciation or business English. What particularly fascinated you about testing and assessment? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right that uh, many teachers do find their specialism within English language teaching. Uh, I've always thought of testing and assessment as, as the black sheep of uh, the ELT world because really when we're in the classroom, when we're out of the classroom, very little of our job isn't concerned with evaluation or assessment of some form. Uh, we're always assessing how well the lesson has gone or seeing whether our students are making progress or deciding whether to move on to the next topic or, or area. And yet, there's so little uh, initial teacher training devoted to testing and assessment, and I think that means that teachers can be scared of it as, um, as a concept and also as a, a practice that they feel they're on top of. And so that kind of interested me. I was an examiner for international exams. I wrote a, an exam preparation book um, for a particular exam when I was working in Thailand. And then I, I got involved in a major national testing project and, and realized at that point uh, how much I had to learn. And so I did an MA focused particularly on language testing to kind of give me the, the background knowledge and the theory to, to support my practice. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, as you say, a lot of teachers and students actually do find exam classes quite serious and even scary. There's a, there's a kind of fear factor about them. But with, with the classes themselves, can they and possibly should they be more fun uh, more for, for both teachers and students? Yeah, I think I think absolutely so. I, one of the things I think we need to acknowledge is that tests make us anxious. That's unavoidable. The mm -hmm. very word test and exam sends a, a shiver down the spine and a, a cold sweat in many people. There are those those rare beasts who enjoy being tested, but <laughs> I think for most teachers and students that the, the concept of testing is um, is quite a a scary concept. But that, that doesn't mean that test preparation classes should be scary. The seriousness aspect of it can be very important and that depends on the, the teacher and the students and the, the focus they want to give to that. But I think scary is unavoidable situation because many of the most fun, most dynamic teaching activities that we do in the classroom are, are actually great for test preparation, particularly those that build the, the underlying skills, the enabling skills for the test itself. They help to reduce the test anxiety when it comes to that moment of the exam. So I think it is the teacher's responsibility to look beyond the test questions and actually get to the underlying um, skills that are being measured and try to think of interesting, exciting, interactive and fun ways to work with those with the students. Absolutely. So you wrote a, a book about this. And can you think of one particular activity which stood out for you from that book, which made exam preparation more fun? One thing I'm really interested in myself is actually learner engagement and learner autonomy within testing and assessment. I think as teachers, we, we can find out so much more about students from the questions they ask than the questions they answer. Mm -hmm. So, for example, inviting students to bring in their own reading text and create questions for their colleagues in the classroom can give the teacher so much insight into what they see as what should be tested, what is being tested, the way that questions work. And that gives the students the power to choose a text that's meaningful for them and to focus in on areas that they've found relevant within the text. I think these kind of throwing the test creation, test construction aspect back to the students can be really rewarding and also very fun for the classroom. Excellent. Yeah, no, that's really, really good advice. OK, let's move on. And I want to ask you a little bit about uh, exam types. Mm -hmm. So do you think formative testing, that is testing that takes place throughout a course, is more effective than summative testing, as in the testing which takes place at the end of a course? I'm going to answer this question in a bit of a roundabout way, I'm afraid, Patrick, because much in, in testing and assessment comes down to the, the answer. It depends. And really what it depends on is, is the purpose of, of why you're testing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you want to know what students are doing well, where you need to push them, where they need help, then formative is the, the only way to do that. 
the way that it feeds back into the learning and teaching process. But if you need to assess the suitability for a particular context outside the classroom or measure against external standards, then, then summative testing is probably fairer to, to have that uh, standardized point at which everybody's being assessed against. If we take a couple of analogies in the summative side, you know, think of something like a driving test. You, you wouldn't want your driving test result to be based on your performance in, in the first lesson when you get <laughs> behind the wheel. Definitely uh, not. You'd, want to, you'd want to have the value of all your learning and all your experience and when you're ready for that final moment of being tested that's the appropriate test at that point but no more would you uh, go to the doctor with symptoms in april and be told well um, i'll give you some uh, i'll give you a cure in in december that's not appropriate when we want to have things diagnosed we want to respond to them quickly then we have to have formative assessment built into the course or to the to the syllabus to allow the teacher to respond appropriately i think one of the other things to introduce here is is the, the idea of learning-oriented assessment, which is a relatively new concept and tries to bridge the gap or reduce the tension between formative and summative testing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it tries to make the point that many summative test tasks, those kind of exam-type questions, can be used with a formative assessment purpose and, and also as teaching and learning materials, taking a final test task and breaking it down, reworking the questions, allowing learners to become involved with analyzing the questions, giving meaningful feedback on those rather than just a, a score or a, a percentage, gets learners seeing it as a, a cycle rather than this linear progression towards the scary moment at the end of the course. Okay, yeah, that's really, really interesting. Um, so let's move on again. So teachers are often concerned that their exam classes teach students to pass the exam so they get a lot of exam technique practice without at the same time developing their language skills and proficiency not in relation to the exam. Is it possible to develop language skills and proficiency while also teaching exam technique? Yeah, I mean, this is something that we call washback, it's the effect that a, a final test has on the, the teaching and learning that leads up to it. And, and you're absolutely right that um, there is a fear of kind of teaching towards the test and teachers can feel that all they're doing is really practicing exam questions and teaching exam strategies. I think it's unfair in some ways to blame the, the test developer for this. It's, in my perspective, it's the teacher's job to understand the test and what it's testing and to look for ways to develop the, the underlying skills or knowledge that's being measured by the test in creative ways. For example, you've got a reading test that you know is going to be a piece of text with multiple choice questions. Why not take away the options and make it a race in the classroom to circle where the correct answer can be found in the text? Or, as we said earlier, get learners to bring in their own text and make questions based on them. Or get groups to work on a question each and explain to the rest how they got the answer in, in their first language if necessary. Because what we're actually trying to do is get beyond the, the test item type and look at what's being actually tested. And so I think all of those skills that are being developed in a good language learning environment are the skills that a good test is, is trying to measure, just for the teacher to see the bridge between the two. OK. Now, last year, the EL Gazette reported that China was going to roll out national language tests in 2020. But bearing in mind the different language learning issues experienced by various nationalities, do you think more nations will follow suit and have their own individual national language tests, or do you think there should be a continued international standard exam like IELTS? Yeah, very good question uh, and very relevant um, for changes that are happening in kind of the move towards international standards across education, across curriculum areas, um, national tests, international standards like PISA and TIMS uh, get a lot of headline attention and are very important for education ministries who, who set policies. Um, I think it's important to remember that many countries already develop their own national tests. In, in the recent years, I've been involved in, in development and validation of national tests in Austria and Germany and Nepal for very contrasting contexts. The, the national focus tests do have the advantage of being able to consider cultural and educational backgrounds and expectations, and also, importantly for me, developing the local capacity for test development. So countries, teachers and test designers are not dependent on external sources, but actually develop their own self-sufficiency and capacity to work with testing and assessment. But on the other hand, I don't think that accommodating to or, or explicit testing of first language influences on, on second language language use are, are a particularly healthy way for test practices to go. I think cross-cultural communication, interaction between plurilingual speakers is the norm in many contexts. Mm -hmm. And I think international standards are probably a way, good way to reflect this, if not international exams. 
the international standards that we have around common points of reference, ways to talk about levels of proficiency uh, are a good way to go, despite their limitations or their potential for misuse in some contexts. Okay, so possibly there's, there's, there's room for both, essentially. Finally, my last question. From your uh, experience, what's the most important advice you would give to a teacher uh, about to start a new exam class? And it, it could be any exam class. Um, I think the most important piece of advice I would give is is know the exam. Know your exam really well. At the very least, take it as if you were a test taker and think about the kind of the cognitive processes, the way you would address the questions as a, as a test taker. Try to, to look under the bonnet of the test and get a, a good understanding of what each task or each set of items is, is really trying to measure. And ask your colleagues for their opinions on it, on their experiences of teaching that exam and to that exam. Look for ways in which you can break the tasks in the, in the test down into smaller chunks and look for teaching activities which focus on the smaller parts rather than just practicing the whole in, in, one, um, in one lump. There's the big danger that teaching an exam class becomes one long test practice exercise with very little actual teaching going on. So put yourself in your students' shoes. What would you want to know about each part of the exam if you were going to take it, and how does your lesson help them develop those skills? And if you can answer that question to yourself successfully after each lesson you teach, then I think you're doing pretty well as a, a teacher of exam classes. Wow, that's absolutely brilliant. That's fan- fantastic advice. Well, it's been really, really great to speak to you and to learn a lot more about your experience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much. Absolutely. And uh, look forward to hearing a lot more about Nile in the coming months. Absolutely. You certainly will. Cheers. Take care. Thank you, Patrick.